Welcome to Idlewild Cottage, a quiet place where kindred spirits can linger together over a cup of tea, savoring all things lovely and cozy. My name is Juliana, and I'm delighted to have you. Each episode here at the cottage will center around a theme. That theme will be celebrated in a number of ways, through literature, art, nature, and even some favorite movie scenes, we'll cherish the sweet and simple things of life. So make yourself at home, and I'll put the kettle on. Hello, kindred spirits, and welcome back to Idlewild Cottage. It is a delight to gather together once again, after quite a long break, for our winter series. This will be a shorter every other week series this time around, but I do hope it will still provide all things lovely and cozy for you in this quiet little corner of the podcast world. Over Christmas break, my daughter and I revisited one of our all-time favorite movies, The Sound of Music. The song, Favorite Things, inspired the content for today's episode, as you may have already guessed. In keeping with the spirit of this movie, let's imagine ourselves circled around the cozy parlor here at Idlewild Cottage, where we'll invite an Austrian flair to warm the atmosphere. As the snow blankets our winter wonderland outside, we'll slowly sip our tea, the strains of merry folk music rising from the Victrola. I'll pass around some favorite Austrian goodies, traditional Linzer cookies filled with raspberry jam. Let's sip and savor and invite the words of Fräulein Maria to quiet our minds and hearts by shifting our focus to a few of our favorite things. Raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens, bright copper kettles and warm woolen mittens, brown paper packages tied up with strings. These are a few of my favorite things. Throughout our time together today, we'll jump into several literary moments in which beloved heroines find joy in their favorite things. Let's not stray too far from Austria quite yet and make our way over to Switzerland. Here we find a young girl, no doubt wearing warm woolen mittens and delighting in snowflakes that stay on her nose and eyelashes. You may have already guessed that we'll be visiting our dear friend Heidi. And one of her favorite things is revealed early on in this charming book, her alpine surroundings. More specifically, Heidi is mesmerized by what she calls fire on the mountain at sunset. In this scene, we find Heidi and Peter, the goat herd, closing their first day together. The day had imperceptibly gone, and the sun was about to disappear behind the mountains. Heidi sat on the ground and looked quietly on. The rocks above began to shimmer and to flash. Suddenly, Heidi sprang to her feet, shouting, Peter, Peter, fire, it is burning. All the mountains are in flames. The great plain of snow is on fire. It always looks like that, said Peter good-naturedly. But it's not fire. What is it then? asked Heidi. It comes of itself, explained Peter. Oh, how beautiful it is. Look at the snow, red as rose. Oh, on the rocks above are a great many roses. As the sun dips slowly over the peaks, the world pales to shadow and gray. Heidi is much troubled until Peter promises it will be just the same tomorrow. The two then return to the hut, where Heidi eagerly shares about her day with the grandfather. Heidi began to describe the mountain with the large snow field. She told how beautiful it had been, especially about the fire in the evening, and asked the grandfather what the cause of it was. The sun does that, said the grandfather, when he bids the mountains good night. He casts his most beautiful rays on them, so that they may not forget him until he comes back again in the morning. This pleased Heidi so much that she could hardly wait until the morrow when she could go again 
and see how the sun bid the mountains good night. As Heidi slips into a dreamland filled with rosy mountain peaks, let's join another little girl who gradually finds joy in her new surroundings. If any of our heroines are what Fräulein Maria would call girls in white dresses with blue satin sashes, then Mary Lennox likely fits the description. And what is one of Mary's favorite things? Why, the secret garden, of course. She especially loves the quiet, secluded nature of this magical place. The sun shone down for nearly a week on the secret garden. The secret garden was what Mary called it when she was thinking of it. She liked the name, and she liked still more the feeling that when its beautiful old walls shut her in, no one knew where she was. It seemed almost like being shut out of the world in some fairy place. The few books she had read and liked had been fairy story books, and she had read of secret gardens in some of the stories. Sometimes people went to sleep in them for a hundred years. She had no intention of going to sleep, and in fact, she was becoming wider awake every day which passed at Misselthwaite. Mary was an odd, determined little person, and now she had something interesting to be determined about, she was very much absorbed indeed. She worked and dug and pulled up weeds steadily, only becoming more pleased with her work every hour instead of tiring of it. It seemed to her like a fascinating sort of play. She found many more of the sprouting pale green points than she had ever hoped to find, and wondered how long it would be before they showed that they were flowers. Sometimes she stopped digging to look at the garden and try to imagine what it would be like when it was covered with thousands of lovely things in bloom. The silver-white winters of Maria's song brings us to a snug little house in the big woods. In one of my favorite little house scenes, we discover that cozy home comforts, especially during the winter months, are among Laura's favorite things, too. Laura and Mary must play in the house now, for it was cold outdoors. The fire in the cook stove never went out. The attic was a lovely place to play. The large, round-colored pumpkins made beautiful chairs and tables. The red peppers and the onions dangled overhead. The hams and venison hung in their paper wrappings, and all the bunches of dried herbs gave the place a dusty, spicy smell. Often the wind howled outside with a cold and lonesome sound, but in the attic, Laura and Mary played house with the squashes and the pumpkins, and everything was snug and cozy. The best times of all were at night. After supper, Pa brought his traps in from the shed to grease them by the fire. While he greased the traps, Pa told Laura and Mary little jokes and stories. Then he laid away the traps, and he took his fiddle out of its box and began to play. That was the best time of all. Music brings out the best in Betsy Ray of Deep Valley, too. Now, Betsy has many favorite things, which makes her the charming heroine that she is. In this scene from Heaven to Betsy, Betsy's sister Julia is hosting a Christmas party. Betsy has been escorted home by the dashing Tony and invites him in for refreshments. It is here that Betsy discovers a new spin, so to speak, on a favorite pastime, dancing. The rugs had been rolled up in the music room and parlor. Mrs. Ray was at the piano and four couples were dancing a two-step. Tony and Betsy took off their overshoes, and Tony swung Betsy into the dance. Betsy had never been to a dance, but she had danced all her life. The rugs in the Ray house were often rolled up for an impromptu waltz or two-step to one of Mrs. Ray's tunes. Gosh, Betsy, you can dance, said Tony. You've learned somewhere yourself, Betsy replied, and indeed he had. Tony danced with the feeling for rhythm that made his ragtime singing so exceptional. 
he danced with subtlety, inventing steps as he went, and Betsy followed him perfectly without missing a beat. Julia's crowd, after calling out greetings, paid little attention to them. As for Tony and Betsy, they forgot that the others were there. They did not speak to each other. They were too intent upon their dancing. Betsy danced on the tips of her toes. Standing so, she was just about Tony's height, and they moved like one person. I believe I like dancing better than anything else in the world, Betsy thought. Another kindred spirit who finds delight in just about anything and everything is, of course, Anne Shirley. As we wrap up our time together today, we'll step into Anne of Windy Poplars. This beautiful winter scene highlights two of Anne's especially favorite things, spending time in nature and spending time with kindred spirits. Although in this case, Anne is still working to thaw out the kindred spirit in the icy, reserved Catherine Brook. The charm of Anne Shirley and Green Gables, as always, breaks the spell. Let's swallow the last of our tea now and bundle up in our Edwardian woolen wear. We'll dig up the snowshoes and join Anne and Catherine for a winter walk, where we just might spy wild geese that fly with a moon on their wings. I've always found it hard to resist the lure of a moonlight night, said Anne after supper. How about a snowshoe tramp, Miss Brooke? I think that I've heard that you snowshoe. Yes, it's the only thing I can do. But I haven't done it for six years, said Catherine with a shrug. Anne rooted out her snowshoes from the garret, and Davy shot over to Orchard Slope to borrow an old pair of Diana's for Catherine. They went through Lover's Lane full of lovely tree shadows and across fields where little fir trees fringed the fences and through woods which were full of secrets they seemed always on the point of whispering to you but never did and through open glades that were like pools of silver. They did not talk or want to talk. It was as if they were afraid to talk for fear of spoiling something beautiful. But Anne had never felt so near Catherine Brooke before. By some magic of its own, the winter night had brought them together. Well, friends, I'm grateful for the magic of this winter time bringing us together here in the warmth of Idlewild Cottage. One of my favorite things is knowing that we are connecting with kindred spirits around the world. And to that end, your likes, shares, and five-star reviews are very much appreciated. In closing, I'd like to share one of my favorite psalms with you. Psalm 1611 reads, You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. Friends, these joys and pleasures are indeed gifts from God's hand. If we tune in to the gifts around us, we will see that naming our favorite things, as Maria taught the Von Trapp children to do, shifts our focus away from fear and toward gratitude. Would these cozy winter days inspire us to name the simple yet beautiful things around us, and through them, find fullness of joy. Thank you for joining me today, dear ones. Please come again soon to Idlewild Cottage. <laughs>